Thank you so much, our worship team, this morning, for leading us to the praises of Most High God. May God continue to bless you and to use you. May you sing when the saints are marching on, declaring the praises of his name that has given us power to overcome in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you this morning as we come together in the Fire of Life International Ministry, Houston, Texas, praising your name, prepared to fellowship, to hear from you, to be blessed, to see your power, to see your miracle happening in our life. Thank you so much, sir. May God continue to bless us and use this place to reach touch many lives, many souls. And you will recognize solution, salvation that God has brought to you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. This morning, speak to our hearts. Help in our hearts. Empower us, Lord, so that we will conquer and overcome every challenge in our world. In Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 20, let's read it quickly. As I exhort you this morning. With the word from Matthew, Matthew chapter 20, Matthew 2 0. I read from 2 0, 20, 20. Amen. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? That is, what do you want? She said unto him, Grant that this my two sons may sit, the one on the right hand and the other on the left in the kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, we are able. I want somebody to declare that within yourself. Say, I am able. What's up? When I was reading this, that Holy Spirit illuminated or ministered to my heart. When many of us are seriously battling, struggling with things of this world, some are not battling for things of heaven only, they were battling for the values. <laughs> this is another level entirely. They were not thinking of how do they get to heaven. They were looking at even the position they were in heaven. <laughs> this is so crazy, man. This is deep. If it was only him or only two of them, that would be heaven. Now, even with the mother, they came with such idea. And in the presence of the mother, I was asking, do you know the, what the cost? I said, yes, we know. We know before we came. And verse 23, and he said unto them, He shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left, it is not mine to be, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. Here comes the son of Zebedee. You know who are the son of Zebedee? talking of James and John. 
with their mother this time around. They discover they are the Mary in their closest. This kind of things is not important. It came from decision. They discover the truth. They discover the mystery of the kingdom of God. They discover the kingdom of God is such real that they are looking for this place, a position there. Like the people that discover the cryptocurrency. They knew it in turn. This is going to be coin. The oh, the value is going to be great. Secure it right. And Jesus was saying, Do you know? Because they say, Yes, we know. We know before we came. Whatever the cost, even if they never knew before, they were looking at it. The cost is not important. The price is not important. But the value, what we are seeing whatsoever, that could be the cost we are ready. And very sad, one of them was the first to be killed. And the second was then was the last to be killed. Jesus Christ named them Bernadette, sons of and when they face situations difficult that they wouldn't allow Jesus to stay in that small city, they said, Jesus, let's send, send them thunder here and kill everyone. Who knows the reason why Jesus called them the son of thunder? But do you know one thing? By the time they passed through Jesus, the son of thunder became the son of John changed his message after encounter with Jesus. He was not thinking of destroying those that are wicked anymore. He rather speaking of, if you have ever known him, this is what you will know, the love that will spring from your heart. Your message shall be changed today in the name of Jesus. Many people because they never pass to him, make their message a prophecy. It's not that you are not preaching messages, but your messages as identified, you have not met him. After meeting him, the message changed. It's not that you are not a mother. It's not that you are not a boss. It's not that you are not a child. You are not a child. It's not that you are not a reverend. It's not that you are not an engineer. It's not that whatsoever you are not, you are. But when you pass through him, something changed in your life. Something dropped in your life. You started in a particular form. You ended in another form. Let's stand on our feet as we pray. He became the same person who had no kind of things to and never minded. He rather continue in his glory. He rather continue in his fellowship. Whatsoever they may be doing, he never bothered. He was focused in Jesus. Jesus alone. Go and look at a lot of misunderstandings that happened in the beginning of church, you will never find the name of John there. Go and look, study all the problems that happen. He's not bothered about that. He's bothered about what he has Jesus Christ. How he will fulfill that. When your vision consumes you, you will mind your vision than minding people. You will mind your vision than minding situation. You will mind your vision that mind these circumstances. That is the power of vision. You won't allow anything to remove that from you. And you will defend it spiritually and physically. I want us to pray. If you have a vision this morning, to defend that vision is not a joke. Spiritually and physically. If you have vision, you will not allow circumstances to take away that vision. You will not allow what is happening around you to take away that vision. You will give your life to defend that vision. And we are going to pray this morning. 
What are those things? If you've not even picked the vision, it is time to think deep on what your vision is. And when you pick the vision, it is time to know the cost of fulfilling that vision by not allowing what you see, circumstances, situation to distract you. And you give your life to him. And the more you stay with him, the more you will be able to fulfill the vision. The more many things will drop from you and many things will come into you. He never had that kind of love or experience before. It was for staying with Jesus that brought that thing. So let me thank him, let's appreciate him for bringing us to this light. The same way he brought John, he brought James. The same way he called them. And the same way they started as the thunder, but ended with love. Ended with the message of Jesus Christ. Ended with power. Ended with wishing. It is the same person that wished that the thunder come to consume. Ended up wishing above all to be well in the spirit and to prosper in our soul. Father, we thank you this morning for your message to change us, for your message to transform us, for coming to our life. We we'll give you glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Father, we pray, Lord, that you will take away those things that are ours and replace them by things that are yours. In the name of Jesus. Father, as we behold you like in the mirror, Father, that we'll be transformed to like image of the Son of God. Father, we destroy all the manipulation in the spirit realm to lure us into sin, to weaken us. We destroy that in the name of Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that your glory will reign in our life. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. God bless you. I want to use this opportunity to congratulate somebody that luckily today is the day she came to this world. Merci, Clara. May God continue to bless you, give you wisdom, give you very long life, and we shall be celebrated in Jesus' name. Rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth. Bear it all things, believe it all things, hope it all things, endure it all things. Charity never fails, for, what, for whether there be prophecy, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall fail. Whether there be knowledge, they shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. For when that which is perfect is gone, then that which is in part shall be done. When I was a child, I spake as a child, understood as a child, taught as a child. But when I became a man, I took away childhood. For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abided faith, hope, charity, peace, faith, 
Good morning, saints. God bless you. Good to see you. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you for those of us who join us on Facebook. Pray that this word will meet you exactly where you are in Jesus' name. All right, let's go ahead and open up our Bibles to the book of Matthew. And we're going to be in the fifth chapter. And we're going to read from verses 43 to 48. <clears throat> Matthew, we are in chapter 5. And we're going to read from verses 43 to 48. And these are the red letters of Christ. And it reads, Ye have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the publicans, the tax collectors, don't they do the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you, excuse me, more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore Perfect. This is the text I want us to really focus on. This is the signal test of the day. Verse 48. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful occasion, for the opportunity to preach the gospel, to hear the gospel, to fellowship in the name of your Son. Father, I pray that you would enable me to preach exactly what you have on your heart and on your mind this morning and this afternoon. Lord, I pray that you would steal from my heart anything that I've hatched there that you don't want your people to hear, anything that's a product of my imagination and not your heart. Holy Ghost fire, consume right now in the name of Jesus. Anything that you would like to add, Lord, the service is yours. The kingdom is yours the glory, the power, everything belongs to you. So I pray, Lord, that you would use me as only you can. Enable me to share your word. And let it go forth with the power and the unction of your spirit. And we ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Jesus says in this text, for us to be perfect. Go ahead and ask your neighbor. Neighbor, are you perfect? Uh, out there in Facebook land, go ahead and ask yourself, are, are you perfect? <laughs> Does Jesus expect me, a human being, flesh and blood from the soil? Does Jesus expect me to be perfect? <laughs> uh, I, I want to go ahead and break this down for you because I don't want you to be discouraged or dismayed. Perfection has different expressions, different forms. Practically every day when I say my prayers to the Lord in the morning, I thank God that I was born perfect. Really? Perfect? Yeah, I was born perfect. In the sense that what? Born with two hands, five fingers on each hand, two feet, five toes on both feet, ten fingers, ten toes, all my body parts are here. Nothing missing, nothing lacking. I was born perfect according to my stage of development. 
But there's another perfection that I wasn't born with, and I still haven't arrived at, and that's called maturity. Somebody say maturity. I think my mother is very thankful, more than I am, <laughs> that I wasn't born full grown. I was not born completely mature. God is telling us here to be perfect in the sense of being complete, watch this, and in the sense of being mature. When you were born again, you were already complete. Spiritually, you were complete. But now your walk, now your fight is to work this thing out so that you become mature, so that you become the reflection of whatever it is that God envisioned when he formed you. Jesus says that except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom. Hmm. What does it mean to exceed? It means to go beyond. Now, Jesus says something interesting about the Pharisees. He said that they laid burdens upon people that were difficult to bear, and they wouldn't help them with one fingertip. And Jesus says that his yoke is easy, watch this, and his burden is light. What was it that was hypocritical about the Pharisees? They had a righteousness, but their righteousness was all on the outside. It was all external. It was all in ritual. It was all in performance. It wasn't from the heart. Now, is that easier or is that harder? Is it easier for you to perform rituals? Is it easier for you to come to church, pay your tithes? Is it easier for you to get baptized, take communion? Is it easier to go through all the hoops that the scribes and the Pharisees put on the people to become religious? Or is it easier to love? Is it easier to do all these things, or is it easier to love? In a sense, it's harder to be religious. In a sense, it's easier. Let me explain. It's easier in the sense that you can do it without the help of God. There are people, Muslims, who pray five times a day. They say they shahada. They do their pilgrimages. They fast during Ramadan, and they do all that without God's help. Hmm. They can do it, but it requires the effort of the flesh. In order for me to look at a woman who's beautiful and not lust after her in my heart, you know what has to happen? I have to be delivered. It's easier and harder, in a sense, to be simply religious. It's easier because you don't need God to accomplish it, it's harder because it requires more work. I hope that makes sense. Jesus said that upon this commandment to love, it hangs all the law and the prophet. If you want to fulfill the commandments of God, if you want to fulfill the Ten Commandments, all you have to do is love. Why? Because if you love God, you're not going to say his name in vain. You're not going to use it as a profane thing. If you love your fellow man, you're not going to covet what he has. You're not going to want to sleep with his wife. The Bible says, watch this in 2 Corinthians, that the letter killeth. The letter kills but the Spirit gives life. Somebody say that with me. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Why do we have speeding laws? Why do we have a speed limit? Why is it that when you drive on the road, there's a sign that says you've got to drive 40 miles per hour on this road? I'm going to take the most optimistic view of society and say that they really just don't want us to get into accidents and die. Okay, let's say that the purpose of those laws is to protect people. Now let's just pretend, God forbid, Pastor Adewale had a heart attack right now. And we had to go into my car and we had to drive to the hospital to get him some help. Now we end up going beyond 40 miles per hour. We end up going, let's say, 65 miles per hour because we rushing to get this man to the hospital so he could live. Police stop me while I'm driving. 
say, you're going over the speed limit, man. I say, hey, you see, that's my, my brother here. He's dying in the car. And he said, I don't care. He goes and he takes my driver's license, and he takes 15, 20 minutes like they usually do, scan everything, give me my driver's license back. By the time I get my license back, he's dead. Now, the literal application of the law has gone against the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is to preserve life. But now by stopping me from transgressing the law in order to save somebody's life, I have violated the purpose of the law. That's the danger of having letter. That's the danger of having literal interpretation without having the heart and mind of God attached to it. Boy, I hope this is making sense. So God actually enjoins he builds love into the walk of Christianity. There are so many people who are trying to do this thing called Christianity, and they think they're doing God's service by judging people, scolding people, putting people down, not understanding that the whole purpose of this book, the whole purpose of this faith, the whole purpose that God had in bringing Jesus Christ into the world was to establish love in the universe. Boy, I hope this is making sense. So Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, and verse 12, he says, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now this is going to be the most important thing that you ever hear me say. If you've never listened to a word that I've ever said, I want you to pay attention to what I'm saying right now. Everybody that's in your life, everybody with whom you have a relationship, wants something. Everybody that you're connected to has desire. If you are able to anticipate, to predict what the desires of other people are and fulfill those desires, help them get what they want, you will, <laughs> you will have learned more, you will have done more, you will have accomplished more than you will ever accomplish in school. This wisdom that I'm teaching you right now is more important than a PhD. He says that if you can do that, if you can seek first, that's really what it means to seek the kingdom, to seek God, to seek God's will for your life and the lives of other people. If you can do that, if you can help people fulfill God's purpose for them, then God will make sure that everything else is added to you. That's how important love is. He builds it into the kingdom. He builds it into the very foundation of the kingdom. He says that if you touch upon anything, if you have two Christians who touch upon anything, it's going to be done. <laughs> now I want you to think about that. <laughs> Is he literally saying that if you take any two Christians on earth and they come together and they agree upon a point, that whatever they agree upon is going to come to pass? Boy, I hope that's not true. Because <laughs> all I need is for two so-called Christians to hate me and meet each other and pray for my destruction. I'm gone. What's the point? What's Jesus' point? And I do believe there's power in agreement. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I believe the higher meaning is that if you have, if your prayer is only concerned about you, if you can't find anybody else to agree with about what you're trying to do, it's probably not an honorable prayer. If whatever you're praying for doesn't concern the interest of anybody else besides yourself, it's the same reason why he doesn't say, my father, which are our father, which art in heaven. He, it, Christianity is a covenant community. And he, he puts these commandments there because it's so necessary for us to walk in love in order for us to live this thing out. So what is he saying literally in the text? I want to go ahead and get to the text and, and, and speak literally for a second. Listen. Jesus here is comparing the love that God has for mankind to the Son. Okay, He compares the love that God has for people to the sun. Why does the sun shine upon the grass? Somebody talk to me. Why? Why, Why does the sun shine upon the grass? Why does the sun shine upon the tree? Why does the sun shine upon the heavens? Because the sun is bright and these things are there. 
The reason why the sun shines upon the trees is because the sun is bright and the trees are there. The reason why God loves you is because God is love and you exist. The love that he has for you is independent of who you are. It has everything to do with who he is, and that's why his love does not discriminate. He causes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. Why? Because the love that he has originates from himself. He loves because he is love. It's his very nature. The best sermon that I heard about love came from a man that was mentally ill. I was in this uh, group home, people who were mentally ill. Okay, just crazy. And this, this brother was a Christian. I mean, there's, no, there's levels of deliverance. He wasn't quite totally there, okay? But he was talking to me. He put his hand around his sh my shoulder, and he said, let me tell you the kind of people I love. He said, I love crack addicts. I love drug dealers. He said, I love prostitutes. I love pimps. I love thugs. I love gangsters. I love murderers. I'm scared to death. Now, I just met this man. I just started working here. I'm like, get this man away from me. But he was trying to tell me something about God. He was saying that the reason I love all these people is because God loves all these people. And that's truly agape love. Love that isn't dependent upon the righteousness of somebody. See, the reason why you are different from the heathen, watch this, it's not because God loves you, he don't love the heathen. It's because you don't have the sunglasses on no more. You can see it. You're walking in it. You've received it. And what you have to do, watch this, saints, in order for you to reflect this love that God has for people, you need to really receive it. Paul prays that we may know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Wow. You walk in the love by receiving it. So you need to be as a little child, come on, be as a little child and just come before him, receive. Just receive how much he loves you. See, the reason why God rejected the Jews and he put his grace upon the Gentiles and called them into the kingdom was because the Jews were trying to build a credit balance with God. They were trying to earn God's favor. If I do all this, if I do all that, you know, if I go to church, if I do all the sacrifices, if I do all this stuff, I can make God like me. But the Gentiles, watch this, they simply looked... They cast their vision upon what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. The fact that Jesus Christ shed his blood for the souls of all mankind and they made themselves eternal debtors. They made themselves eternal debtors to that love. Religion says, I'm so good, so God, you owe me. But Christianity says, God, you're so good. I could never fulfill what I owe you. I could never give back what you've given me. And so I have this debt of love that I pay to you continually, constantly until I die. Boy, I hope this is making sense. So he's talking here about maturity. Somebody say maturity. The highest expression of maturity as a Christian is love. We just read it in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13. When I was a child, speak as a child. I thought as a child. I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. What's the theme of the chapter? It's love. Being unloving, he's saying here, is being childish. Wow. Hmm. <sighs> Knowledge is also important. Knowledge is also a sign of spiritual maturity. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that solid food Meat is for the mature who have exercised their senses to be able to discern good and evil. But the highest sign, the greatest sign of true Christian maturity is that you love. <laughs> man, I remember I was in, I was in seminary, man. And uh, I, had, I had professors with whom I disagreed. I, I, we, we didn't quite see eye to eye on every issue, which is natural. Okay, we two different people. It's natural to have two different perspectives. All right, that's just a part of being human. But it was funny that just the disagreements that we had, myself as a student with them as professors, these are people that have PhDs, 
degrees upon degrees, more degrees than a thermometer in the things of God. And because we had philosophical disagreements, because we had theological differences, some of these people actually tried to sabotage me. Y'all know me, I'm not the kind of person to try to make excuses for anything. I had professors in school who, who, who gave me grades. I had meetings, and at one, one time, one woman just had to break down and said, oh, oh, you, you caught me, Emmanuel. What do you want me to do? They were exposed. They literally put, marked me down because we didn't see the eye to eye upon certain issues. These are people who are advanced intellectually, but babies. Because if you can't walk in, if you can't overcome offenses, you are childish. That's what the word of God is saying. <laughs> See, it's sad that before the church ever integrated in America, before black and white ever became one in the American church, it really still hasn't happened. Dr. King said that the most divided time of the week is Sunday morning. That's the most divisive time between black and white in America is Sunday morning. We're still not together. But you know what institutions have made progress in unity before we have? Sports. It's sad that basketball teams have picked up seven foot, 300 pound black players. They were making inroads in racism before the church ever did. Why? 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 Because when your mindset is to win, you have a whole different attitude. Jesus says that the, the kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. What is he talking about? He's saying that the kingdom of God is being opposed. My kingdom, the realm that I'm bringing with me, is being attacked. It's suffering violence. And he said, the violent take it by force. What I believe he's saying is that my work is being opposed by darkness. And if you're with me, if you're in the kingdom, the only way that you're going to be able to make it is if your passion for truth and righteousness is stronger than the hatred that you're going to have to endure as my follower. When you see this thing as a matter of victory, as a matter of warfare, it's not just coming together and being happy and nice. You know, if you love to worship and you're a nice person coming to church, no. This is about warfare. This is about Jesus Christ getting the spoils of his victory. And when you see it like that, then all the artificial stuff becomes not important. The Bible says that Jesus Christ, Paul says that Christ is our peace. Wow. He is our peace. He is our reconciliation. How many of us have seen family disputes? Fathers against uh, the daughter. Fathers against the son. Mother comes in. And because the kids and husband love mama, she's able to bring peace. Because both parties are interested in the one, she becomes the reconciliation. She becomes the peace. There are families that fall apart. After grandma dies, the whole family falls apart. Why? Because grandma was the peace. She was the one that everybody, mama, grandmama, everybody looked to her. Everybody was concerned about how she felt. And so they would get along just because they didn't want to be at odds with grandma. And that's what Jesus Christ is supposed to be to us. Jesus Christ, when he came, he solved the problem of race. He solved the problem of racism, sexism, classism. He said that when Christ, Paul says, talking about the kingdom, he says there's neither Jew nor Greek. Man, there's neither slave nor free. That's a class issue. He gets rid of all this stuff under the banner of Jesus. Boy, I hope this is making sense. And so we're supposed to be united in this thing called love. And we're supposed to do exploits in the kingdom. Why? Why is it that we're supposed to do more? Why does Jesus Christ expect perfection from us? He expects it because we are more. See, the disciple, the true disciple of Jesus Christ is not necessarily the one who knows the most Bible. Even though a disciple is a student, this discipleship is not an informational discipleship. It's a transformational discipleship. 
the, the truest Christian, I, I'm not a great Christian because I know how to read the Bible and I can talk. That doesn't make me a great Christian. A great Christian is somebody whose mind is actually patterned after God and walks in the love that God has commanded us to walk in. There are women out there, older women, 60, 70 years old, who can't quote John 3, 16, but will put my Christianity to shame because of And we, as a body, it, it should bother us. It bothers me when I see people, soldiers, being wheeled around because they only got one leg that works. Soldiers that have their arms blown off and they were willing to make this kind of a sacrifice for a nation, for a country. And they're out on the street now begging because the country don't care about them as much as they care about it. I'm not willing to put my life on the line for Jesus, the one who has already given his life for me. Are you willing to do that? I don't believe that anybody in the world should ever outdo me in sacrifice because of what has been sacrificed for me. And so Jesus says that he has a new command to give. This is John chapter 13. He says, a new command do I have to give you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. Now, is it really a new commandment? Do you know that this commandment is as old as the book of Leviticus? The book of Leviticus, it says to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Is love a new command? No, but Jesus remixed it. <laughs> I used the illustration before. How many of you heard that song by Whitney Houston? I will always love you. And I will always love you. Y'all don't leave now. Okay, I'm just trying to give you an illustration now. Now, how many of us know that Whitney Houston was not the first person to do that song? That song was actually done by Dolly Parton. I think of the 1970s or so. But I didn't know about the song until Whitney sang it. And now that song is associated more with Whitney Houston, Dolly Parton. Why? Because she just did it so good, man. She performed it so well that you can't help but to identify that song with the woman. And by the same token, Jesus Christ exemplified love so perfectly. <laughs> Jesus, hey, Jesus Christ demonstrated love so perfectly that it became as though it was a new commandment. Man. He says, if you just love people that love you, what good is that? What credit is that to you? He says, are, are you just a good daughter when you have a good mama? Are you just a good wife when you have a good husband? Are you just a good husband when you have a good wife? When she dots all your I's and crosses all your T's? That ain't nothing. That's not the love that Jesus Christ is enjoying. I've heard preachers saying that if people can't do nothing for you, just cut them off. You're trying to get somewhere. God got stuff for you to do, baby. You got a destiny. You can't afford to have all these Klingons who can't do nothing for you. I'm telling you, that's antichrist doctrine. That flies right in the face of what Jesus Christ taught right here in the text. He says that you, man, if you only love people who are doing good stuff for you, you're just a regular, ordinary person. But if you're my disciple, you got to love those people who are unlovable. you got to love people who don't give you a reason to love. Why? Why? Because of something called hope. Somebody say hope. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. I want to show you something really quickly. I hope this is hitting home. I'm even convicted now. 1 Corinthians 13 and 13. He says, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. The greatest of these is love. Now, why is charity, why is love greater than faith and hope? He already tells you that love believes all things. He already tells you that faith hopes, excuse me, love hopes. If you don't have hope, 
If you don't have an expectation that things will turn around for somebody, know that you're not truly loving them. If you have a kid and you, you expect him to lie, just like your no good daddy, he's always lying and, and you, just, you cut from the same cloth, know that you are tempting him to be a liar just by the expectation. Just because you don't expect for him to be no better, you are tempting him to be what it is that you've called him in your own heart. Even Jesus couldn't do great works among certain people because of the expectations that they had. Listen to me. God, had to, God convicted me about this. I took, I think I told some of y'all about this already. I took uh, this boy and his fellows, took him to the, to the candy store, took him to the dollar store, and he, and he had a Hershey bar in his pocket as we was about to leave. And I'm, I'm like, man, come on, man. I, I, I'm, I'm here to buy you stuff you're going gonna to steal them underneath my nose. That's messed up. But, um, but so we, we've gone back to the store a couple times, and both times that we went back to the store, before we exited that store, put, his, put my hands on his pockets, make sure he don't have nothing. The Lord convicted me about that. He said, are you trying to shame this boy? And by you doing that, by you feeling his pockets as though it's just, this is him now. This is his, this is just who he is now. You are tempting him to continue to be like that. You got to have better hope. You have to have an expectation for better. Sometimes, man, my, my supervisors have seen me with these kids, and they say, man, these kids are brilliant. They've seen me work with them, and they say, wow, the kids are smart. And the reason why they seem smart, you know why? Is because I talk to them above their heads. I talk to them like they have more intelligence than they really do. And somehow, they meet it. They meet the expectation. They have found, even in education, that when teachers don't have an expectation that their children will succeed, they fail. One of the most important ingredients for a child to succeed at school is to have teachers that believe. Wow. Hope. Hope. An expectation. If you don't have an expectation, if you don't think that this person will turn around, then know that you're not really walking in the love that God wants you to have. And so Jesus says, greater love hath no man than this, but that he lays down his life for his friend. I was trying to convince one of my Muslim buddies. I have a friend, a real good friend, a mechanic. Man, he, the guy has done more for me than any fella I have ever met on that level on a commercial basis. I mean, the guy is, is just bent over backwards to make sure I'm taken care of. Everything with my vehicle for the past five, six years that I've been buying from him, he's made sure everything was all right. He's a Muslim. The guy seemed so sincere, man. We were talking, and I, I, and I just try to drop little things here and there to try to convince him, you know, come with me, man. This is the real deal we got here. And, uh, and um, he said to me, I don't believe in this Christ stuff when it comes to the cross. I believe he's coming back. He told me, I believe Jesus Christ is coming back. I believe that he was a prophet. I believe he was a messenger. But I don't believe that he died for me. I don't believe that he died for nobody. I don't believe that somebody died for my sin. That's not fair. I don't believe that the wicked ever overcome the righteous. Nobody can kill Jesus. Are you kidding me? Somebody killed God's messenger? Somebody killed the prophet of Allah? I don't believe that. Jesus is too great for somebody to kill him. And I just said, man, you're right. It's not fair. Grace is not fair. But greater love has no man. The purpose, the, the, the wisdom behind it, that was the only way that he was going to get us the cross. That's the genius of the cross. He tried the law. He tried putting good examples before the people, but he found that the only way that he could get people to really love him was to demonstrate love towards them. That's the beauty of Christianity. It's not that you are gritting your teeth trying to obey this stuff, man. It's you cast your life upon the love of Jesus. He transforms you. He makes you a new creature. The reason why, man, Another reason why it's a new command is because this love makes you a new creature. 
this love that he shows to you as a child of God, it changes you. <laughs> See, a funny thing happens when you put a piece of metal upon a magnet. What happens? <laughs> the metal becomes magnetized itself. When, you, when you're fellowshipping with Jesus, man, when you get into the realm of his love, you become magnetically bound to him, and you become a magnet. You become a power that brings people to him. He, he uses you to bring people to him because of the love that you effortlessly, effortlessly release into your environment. Well, I hope this is making sense. So as I come to a close, brothers and sisters, Jesus was meek. Somebody say meek. Jesus was meek. He says, I'm meek and I'm lowly. I remember my former pastor, a Nigerian man. He had a very, very small church, only a few people. And you always remind me, Brother Emmanuel, being a pastor, a man of power, all around the place, the camera, it's not about showmanship, it's not about how well you speak. Being a pastor, it's all about service. It's all about the need. After service, he'd make sure he would have his food. She wasn't as committed as he was. All the food, everything, he would prepare. The only few people would even show up. Half the time, I was the only one up there. And he would make sure he had the food prepared for the people every single Sunday. Ty wasn't even enough to be person. But he felt like it was his bounding duty as a man of God to make sure that he served in that way beyond just the ministry. Jesus, great as he was, great as he is, He's still about service. He's still about washing feet. <laughs> a wonderful thing, man. I was, I was reading the word. It just struck me. How many of us know that Jesus had a cousin named John the Baptist? And John the Baptist was a bold, bold brother, man. He just, he, when he saw evil, it was just something inside of him. He couldn't help but to reprove it. He just couldn't keep his mouth shut when he saw something that was wrong. And that ended up getting him killed. And Jesus finds out about it. And he wants to go away. I believe this is Matthew chapter 14. He wants to just go away. He just found out that his cousin has been murdered while he was in prison waiting for Jesus to get on with this messianic thing. And while he's trying to get away and just be with the, the father for a little while, he sees a large group of people. He sees a group of people decides to stop his decision. He wants to go away. He decides that he's going to meet the felt need. Watch this. The lack that they were in at that moment was self-induced. It was their own fault. It was their own fault. How many times do we see people who are in need? We see people out on the street who are begging. And we say, well, they're not the deserving poor. It's their own fault. They are born and raised in America. He's healthy. He's got four limbs. Why don't he make something of himself in his own country? I'll tell you the truth. I'll just park here and tell you. One of the worst things that you can do sometimes is to give money to people who are in that situation, who are poor like that. But sometimes you just have to ask the Holy Ghost. Sometimes I, I implore you just to ask God. Even the people who have put themselves in a situation that they we have all put ourselves in a situation that we are in when it comes to sin. And yet Jesus Christ still decided to sacrifice his life for us. And so he sees the people who are without. He sees them starving, and he decides that he's going to do a miracle to feed them. Not long after, he sees a Phoenician woman, a Syrophoenician woman, a woman who is not right. She's not righteous. She's not a part of the Abrahamic covenant. She's not an Israelite. She has nothing coming her way. She asked Jesus for a miracle because her daughter is demon-possessed. Jesus said, man, it's not, it's not right to take the, the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And he says, yeah, Lord, that's true. <sighs> but even the dogs will eat from the crumbs that fall from the master's table. In other words, watch this, saints. 
She, she wasn't asking for the full biscuit. She wasn't asking for a full loaf. She decided that just a crumb of the power of God was enough to move the mountain. She measured God so big, even though it wasn't even her season. It wasn't the season for the Gentiles yet. Jesus Christ, during that time, his work was only for the people who were of the tribe, tribes of Israel. But she was able to transcend a season. She was able to transcend the season that God had in the world simply because she measured God big. She measured Christ big and believed that just the crumb of his power was enough to relieve that mountain that was afflicting her daughter. And I want to tell you that if you have love for God, somebody say love. If you love him, you not only have to believe in your fellow man, you have to believe him. You have to believe that he's on your side. Don't tell me that you love God and you don't have an expectation for good because love believes all things. Love has hope. Love has confidence. Love has an expectation. Love believes that its tomorrow is greater than its today. Don't get into this thing called an evil heart of unbelief. God has this thing where he just has to be believed. He just has to. Why? Because what worse thing can you do than to charge the greatest benefactor the world will ever know with evil? To not believe God is to call him a liar. To say that any one of these promises in this word will fail is to call God a liar to his very face. And he says that if you don't have confidence, if you don't have an expectation, if you don't have faith in what I'm saying, it's impossible for you to please me. <laughs> if you love him, have confidence. If you love him, have faith. <sighs> Finally, this faith that we have, this love that we have compels us to forgive. Somebody say forgive. We have to forgive. He calls us to be mature. He doesn't want us to be childish, childlike, childish. He wants us to be mature. But you know one thing about children that's in a sense more mature than adults? Children forgive easily. Children forgive. Beat them one day, next day, next morning, it's like nothing ever happened. We're grown people, we hold on to stuff. We hold on to grudges. We hold on to offenses. I know they hurt you. I know they did things to you that are completely indefensible. But I want you to know that the you that God wants you to be is on the other side of this offense and on the other side of your forgiveness. There was a pastor I know named Bill Johnson who received this scathing rebuke, a letter where he just beat him all the way down. And he said, I don't agree with what you said, but I love what you said. Because the man that God wants me to be is on the other side. There's a cross for you to bear as a Christian. And you, an old pastor told me something so, so wonderful. <laughs> he said the cross, see, there are people who are going to offend you so bad that the only way that you'll be able to move on is if something inside of you dies. The only way that you'll be able to continue as a Christian the only way that you will keep your sanity and walk this thing out as a believer is if you forgive. Is if what is inside of you that has brought this offense dies. I thank you for listening as long as you praise the name of the Lord. And uh, if you'd like to give, we have our cash app, 508 389 3589. 508. Thank you. That's how the other people say.
Moses, pray for us, exhort us, and the Lord for us. Thank you so much, Pastor Emmanuel Adju. Can you give Jesus a clap up for once again? Amen. Yes. Thank you this morning for vision. This powerful message. This is what we call the message of the cross. To them that perish, it is rubbish. To them that perish, it is arrant nonsense. To them that perish, which I don't believe, I don't like it. But to them, to us that save, is the power of God. And I pray. You see, let me tell you something about the message of the cross, the message of Jesus Christ. Number one, anytime you find the message of Jesus Christ such easy with you as in your life, that's what you have been doing since you are born. And they tell you that you are missing it. It's not human. It's heaven. And anytime you listen to the message of Jesus Christ, you begin to position yourself in it. When you position yourself in it, you will see the one that you have been doing. And you will begin to pay attention to it more. Yeah, that is me. Do you know why you pay attention to it? Because you remember when you started doing it. If you cannot remember when you started doing it, you are not doing it. If you can't remember when he entered into your life, you've not got in it. You are still far away from it. So when you hear it, say, yeah, that is it. I remember I struggled with that. I remember I got it. Then, when you remember that, you will not say, oh, I must not forget that. It's easier to move into faith and to move out of faith. It's easier to have Holy Spirit and to miss to lose him. It's easier to have salvation and to lose your salvation. That is why the Bible says that we guide it diligently. The Bible says, he that thinketh that he standeth, take it. Because it's possible to easily fall. Paul said, I myself have been careful even when the grace is upon me. When I can see abundance, grace, abundance, anointing, I do more than all other apostles. But nevertheless, I have been careful. I can see miss it. And that is why we reflect in a message like this. That is why you look at where you are still missing it. Messages like this before people listen to it, they go on their knees. Today, as Pastor said, messages of Antichrist is the order of the day. What is the message of Antichrist? Listen, any message that exhorts your flesh, any message that exhorts your flesh is going to destroy you. That is the message of Antichrist. But all the messages of Jesus Christ is all about to humble us. To humble us. Even when he has them to have sword, he still asks them not to use it. That is the message of Jesus Christ. When they use sword, he still redeemed the effect of sword back through miracle and love. Now don't let that one go out with one air. <laughs> don't let him look for this plastic surgery. That is Jesus for you. Because you know what? They are all ending in this world. No matter what it is, we will end in this world. You will not enter into the kingdom of God with your body except Jesus comes to transform us physically, which that will only happen when He appears. For those that have not been transformed, God help us. Let's stand on our feet. I want you to pray. Ask God to help you. Ask Holy Spirit. Flesh cannot help you. 
That is why Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, that I've been dead, I'm dead with Christ. It is no more hide than live. You cannot live as you, I, 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 and you make it. Forget it. It doesn't happen that way. Talk to God that Lord Jesus live in me. Let me die to self. Let me die to flesh. Holy Spirit empower me to get it right. Let your light shine my life. Let darkness disappear. Let my self-will disappear. Let your will reign in my life. Lord, by flesh shall no man prevail. I need your spirit, O oh Lord. I need your spirit in my soul. That your word will make sense to me. Your words will make meaning to me. Your word will be important to me. Your word will abide in me. Your word will move me. I will be moved by your word. Not moved by the word that exalt my flesh. Talk to God. Say, Father, save my soul. I need to be saved. I need to be delivered from self. I need to be delivered from the evil world. I need to be delivered from fake messages. I need to be delivered from every manipulation and bewitchment in the name of message. Lord, that you restate yourself in me. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Now I want us to pray if you are having pain anywhere. Just lay your hand on that place you are having. I will let you know that the message of Jesus comes with power. It comes with healing. It comes with peace. And now I want to pray for you. Anywhere you are experiencing pain, let that pain disappear now. In the name of Jesus, let there be healing, let there be healing. Let the healing anointing flow. Bible made us to know that immediately Jesus finished the message. He healed every folk. Every folk he healed them. Begin to receive your healing now. Let there be miracle. Let there be miracle. Let there be healing. Let there be deliverance. Let there be deliverance. That spirit of affliction, spirit of insanity, spirit of poverty, spirit of depression is going out now. Out now. Out now. Out now. In the name of Jesus. Spirit of murder is going out now. Spirit of suicide is going out now. In the name of Jesus, let the light of God shine in your heart. Let there be joy. Let there be peace. Let there be celebration. In the name of Jesus, Father, we pray for open doors. We pray for opportunities, connections. Every difficulty is the devil is causing around you. Circumstances, frustration, they are scattered now. They are destroyed now. In the name of Jesus, Father, by power we take the kingdom. By power we take the kingdom, Lord. By fire we take the kingdom, Lord. Oh, Father, that your kingdom will abide with us. Jesus said, if I cast out devil by the kingdom, by the finger of God, the kingdom of God has come unto you. We chase away demons, we chase away evil spirits, we chase away all the powers of darkness. That the kingdom of God rests upon us. Father, we pray this week will be a glorious week. We pray, Lord, this week will be a victorious week. Holy Spirit, we go on our way. You make all the quick way straight, Lord. We cut the bars of irons. We cut the gate of brass. We ask, Lord, your spirit will make this ease for us. Without struggle. Struggle has come to an end. Struggle has come to an end. The spirit will help us. We strengthen us. Angels of God will go on his ways to help us. Thank you, Heavenly Father. It is not by power. It is not by might. But my spirit said, the Lord. Father, we wish you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's share the grace in fellowship together. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and fellowship of Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, 
you will miss a message for God. All the days of our life, and we shall then be asked of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Spirit of God, touch me to declare to that soul, to that spirit of forgetfulness is out of your life in the name of Jesus. Receive the power of retentive memory in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday.